All right. So we're going to talk about DNA, structure of DNA, because we, yesterday we talked about variation and how all the crossing over of the chromosomes and stuff can lead to all of this variation. We talked about alleles and the different forms of genes and Mendel, okay, and all that kind of stuff. Today we're going to look at the cause of all of that, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, okay. Now, the discovery of DNA was huge, okay, because it, the, its structure immediately um, gave evidence for how DNA could be copied, how DNA could be passed on, how it could, how its structure could be used to encode for things. Okay, um, basically, back in the back in the old days when computers were things that took up entire rooms, okay, and you had to program them with these cards. They were called punch cards, and you would punch out holes in them, and the holes were basically to tell it. Zero one zero one. That's how you program. But the computers only understand on and off. Okay. When you made these punch cards, you could stick it in, and that was your program. Was the series and locations of all the holes. Okay. Well, DNA is very much like the zeros and ones that a computer uses to decide what it's doing. Okay. Well, DNA has got pairs of bases that go down the strands. Okay. Indicating essentially like zeros and ones. Okay. And the everyone's sequence of those bases is slightly different, all right? And that's why each of us is slightly different. And that's what they use in, like, CSI when they're, you know, doing the DNA tests and trying to decide who the culprit is, okay? Well, everyone's sequence is slightly different. When they, when they match it up, it's like a one in seven billion, okay, match, which basically means there's nobody else in the world except you with that particular sequence, okay? Even identical twins have slight differences, okay, in their DNA. All right. Uh, so we got to understand how the structure of DNA makes it capable of storing genetic information. Look at how it was discovered, and look at some technologies related to DNA based on their uses and implications. All right. So prior to dividing, cells double their DNA. Every one of your cells in your body is supposed to have two copies of everything. So when a cell divides, the first thing it needs to do is make four copies of everything, so that each of the daughter cells will have two copies. Right? That's an important process. Okay. Um, when gametes are being made, the first cell division involves a doubling, but the second cell division does not. That way, your gametes end up with only how many copies? One. Okay. That way, when sperm meets egg, you have a cell with two copies. Okay. One from mom, one from dad. All right. So the process looks kind of like this. If you're looking at a cell, okay, that's kind of under normal conditions, we call that interphase. All right. And you can see that the nucleus is here, and the rest of the cell is pretty fairly defined. Okay. When you start getting into prophase, you start seeing that the nucleus starts to change its shape a little bit. It starts to get darker. The nuclear membrane starts to disappear. Okay. What we're seeing in the darkening here is actually the DNA starting to go into its chromosome form. Right? So the strands of DNA are collecting together into the chromosomes. Okay? By late prophase, you can actually see the chromosomes starting to condense and be visible. All right? After that, there's a thing called metaphase. In metaphase, all the chromosomes line up along what's called the metaphase plate, which is where the cell is going to split in half. All right? And then they begin to pull apart in late metaphase, and then the cell essentially splits. On the tips of, of chromosomes are something called telomeres. The telomeres have some ability to attract certain strands of the DNA to collect them into chromosomes. So it sort of knows which sections of DNA. Your DNA, when it's in your, in your nucleus and it's completely unraveled, okay, isn't all one long strand. It's still each chromosome separate. It's just unraveled. Right? So as they begin to ravel up, they just ravel up into that particular one on the telomere. Okay, so the DNA strand that is your that essentially makes up your let's say 19th chromosome just rolls up. Okay, it just goes together. It doesn't join up with anything else. Yeah. All right, so DNA is made up of countless pairs of bases. Okay, the order and arrangement of those bases is what codes for materials and the characteristics that an organism has or requires. The pa the bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay, so A, T, C, and G. Those are the four bases okay, that make up DNA. And they can only pair one way. All right? So um, 
Cytosine always pairs with guanine, and adenine always pairs with thymine. All right, so AT always goes together. CG always goes together. That's how we get this series of essentially zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, all the way down okay, the, uh, the DNA strand. All right, and that sequence of ATCG, ATCG, CG, CG, AT, AT, whatever it is, okay, all the way down is what codes for you having type A blood versus type B blood, okay, green eyes versus blue eyes, whatever. All right, that sequence is all part of that. All right, um, so it was later discovered after the structure of DNA, they figured out that these things paired together by essentially figuring out how much cytosine there was, how much guanine there was, how much adenine there was, and how much thymine there was, and they discovered that there was always exactly the same amount of adenine and thymine, and always exactly the same amount of cytosine and guanine, meaning those two things must pair together okay, with each other. That was kind of how that worked. All right, other evidence is that DNA is species-specific. Okay? The number of chromosomes is different for every organism. Right? Uh, well, not every organism, but essentially every organism has essentially different chromosomes. Not just different numbers usually, but also their chromosomes look different. Right? For example, this is the DNA of a fruit fly. Right? So they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chromosomes, something like that, okay, in their karyotype. Um, and that codes for all the stuff that a fruit fly needs. Okay? You're probably going, fruit flies? What are those? Drosophila melanogaster okay, is the big long name for fruit flies. And if you take university genetics, you will work with fruit flies all the time. All right? They're an awesome organism for doing genetic research because they reproduce quickly and have easily observable traits. In that way, they're even better than peas. Okay? If Mendel had been able to capture and breed fruit flies, he would have done all his research on fruit flies. Okay? Because they breed way, way faster, and they have just as easily identifiable characteristics as pea plants do. Okay? They have different kinds and colors of eyes, different kinds and shapes of wings, and what else was there? Oh, man. It's all kinds of different things you had to look at. Under the dissecting microscope, you gassed them with uh, ether to knock them out, and then you took tweezers and you sorted them. These ones have brick eyes, and these ones have red eyes, and these ones have brown eyes, and you'd sort them all, okay? And you'd figure out which ones had bred with which. You know, it sounds terribly boring, and it is, okay? Uh, but okay, it's one of the things you do, okay? And you can figure out, basically, um, what their genetic code is from that. All right, so that would be fruit fly DNA. This is a human karyotype. All right, so there's 23 pairs of chromosomes here. All right, so you got chromosomes 1, 2, and 3, okay, again, in pairs, one from mom, one from dad, okay, uh, chromosome pairs 4 and 5, okay, 6 through 12, okay, 13 through 15 are smaller ones, 16 through, through 18 are also smaller, okay, they, they kind of get smaller as we go along, with the exception of the sex chromosomes, okay. Is this individual male or female? male, because it's XY, all right? They have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, okay? The Y chromosome is in a lot smaller than the X chromosome, all right? If you are female, you are XX, all right? Which is why many genetic um, abnormalities are X-linked, okay? Which means they occur way more often in males than they do in females. For example, you will probably never in your life meet a colorblind female because the gene for color blindness is on the X chromosome. And females always have two copies of that. So the chance that they will have the recessive, that have two copies of the recessive color blindness gene is incredibly rare. But for a guy, it's a lot more likely because if you have it on your X chromosome, you're color blind because you only have one X chromosome. Okay, so there's a lot of things like that that are X linked, okay? And so they come up more often in males than they do in females. All right. Now, if there were any abnormalities, we would see that in this person's karyotype. Okay. So this is one of the things you would do in, I think it was genetics, sec second year genetics. You actually take, they take, come, come in and take your blood. You centrifuge your blood. Okay. And you can actually, at, um, you look at your cells as they're dividing, your white blood cells, and you start taking essentially pictures of each set of chromosomes, and then you build your own karyotype like this. Okay, so you can see your own chromosomes, which, I mean, who knows whose those are, but all of ours would look essentially like that. Okay, it's kind of cool when you see your own DNA. All right. Now, 
Once biologists agreed DNA was the genetic material, okay, race was underway to discover how its structure could account for the role in inheritance. Okay, if there was like a top 10 list of incredibly important but brief partnerships, Watson and Crick would top that list. Okay, these two guys were, they, I mean, they discovered something incredibly important, the structure of DNA, okay? The stuff they did that they discovered is the basis for all modern genetics. But they didn't get along very well, and they didn't have a very long partnership, okay? They met in a bar, okay? And they decided, after probably a lot of drinks, that they should work together, because at that point it probably made sense, even though they were both kind of egomaniacs, okay? Um, they started working together, they started discovering some things, and after they made these discoveries, it became, well, I discovered that. No, I discovered that. I'm more important than you, you know, whatever. And then okay, then they would go to the bar, and then they'd get along again, and then they would come back and not get along, and then eventually the partnership just broke up. Okay? But while they were working together, okay, they discovered this idea of the cytosine and guanine, okay, adenine, thymine thing. And because they were biochemists, they knew the shape of these molecules. And they predicted that because of these shapes, there would be a repulsion that would result in a twisting. Okay? That this molecule would not be a ladder, that it would be a helix. Okay? Because the, the bases would only fit together a certain way. All right? And so they did this thing called X-ray molecular imaging or X-ray crystallography. So they essentially crystallized the DNA so that it would solidify and not be able to move. Okay? And when they did that, it solidified into this helical shape. Okay? That's the picture that they got by doing this X-ray crystallography. All right? That is a DNA molecule taken from above. Like if you were looking down on it, it would be like looking down on a spiral staircase. Okay? You would see this pattern. Or if you stood underneath the feature out in front of the school there. Has anyone done that yet? Okay? You stand underneath that and look up, what do you see? Yeah, you see the triquetra? Okay, that's but it's kind of wrapped around. That's kind of a weird thing, but okay, that's actually what you can see. If you stand underneath it and look up, you can see the triquetra. It's very much like this picture. Looking down on a DNA molecule, you would see an X because the twisting of the helix would make it look like that. Okay? This part is closer than this part is. Right? And so that gave them this idea that it must be a helix, especially given okay, this dark band around the outside, again, showing the twisting. All right, so um, they took pictures of the molecules. The spots and smudges in the figure, okay, were deflected as they passed through the crystallized DNA. So the X, this is basically, they took an X-ray of DNA instead of taking an X-ray of bones, okay? And obviously the dark places are where, okay, the reflections came back. The light places are where it went through. All right, so that led them to this idea, okay, that DNA was this helical molecule, all right? So they based their model of DNA on what they were able to get from those, okay? And you can see here that we've got G with C, G with C, A with T, and where A with T is, the molecule is narrower because A and T are smaller bases. C and G are bigger, and so they have to be spaced further apart, right? And that creates that spacing and twisting of the molecule, all right? Everybody with me there? All right, and that's all we know about that. Okay, since the bases were either too wide or too narrow to be paired with themselves, okay, and this is kind of what they, they figured out based on um, the shape they saw, they knew adenine and adenine couldn't go together because it would be too far or too narrow, okay? And they knew guanine and guanine couldn't go together because it would force the molecule too far apart and it would be asymmetrical, all right? Um, so they figured out that they, it should have this shape, and then later on, okay, it was discovered that based on um, you know, how much of each thing was in there that they were right, that A and T must go together because they were always present in the same amounts. C and G always went together because they were present in the same amounts. All right. So the ladder-like structure of DNA and the fixed pairing of bases led Watson and Crick to this conclusion. There was no rule to the sequence of the base pairs, okay? So they could come in any sequence, okay? Meaning each strand was like a combination lock with a nearly infinite number of possible sequences, which is why everybody's just a little bit different, all right? Everybody's sequence of A, T, C, whatever is just a little bit different, all right? Okay? And when you consider how much DNA you have and I have, okay, there's a lot of places and opportunities for there to be differences, okay? Now, are there some strands of our DNA that are the same? Yes, 
Hey, some strands of our DNA or some pieces of our DNA are the same, like things that code for basic needs, like insulin and adrenaline, whatever else. There's a certain code for that, right? And for all intents and purposes, the, that section of our DNA, of everybody's DNA, would be essentially the same, right? Unless you were diabetic, and then that sequence would be slightly different because your insulin isn't quite the same as ours or whatever. Um, okay, on things that are what uh, the people in CSI would call markers, okay, would be the things that are typically different between individuals, things like hair color, eye color, okay, blood type, stuff like that, that we know would be an inherited trait rather than an evolutionary trait. Okay, and so those are the things that they look for when they're doing a southern blot. I have no idea. I don't even know why I put that picture on there, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. All right. Now, groups of pairs then could code for any number of genes. Okay, and within these groups, there was the possibility of variation. Okay, like we said, like with you know the examples we've talked about. Okay, so the gene that codes for eye color could have any number of different sequences, giving a large variation in color and shade of people's eyes. I mean, on your driver's license, it says that your eyes are blue, or your eyes are green, or your eyes are brown. Okay, it doesn't say that you have dark brown eyes or that you have light brown eyes, just brown, okay? But obviously, there's different shades of brown, different shades of blue, different shades of green in people's eye color, okay? Yes, I might have the genes that say I'm going to have green eyes, but, you know, my sequence of stuff might say that I would have darker green eyes or because I, I don't have green eyes, okay? Um, but y you get the idea there. Everyone with me? All right. So what we're looking at here is, okay, when your DNA is unwound, Okay, it kind of looks like this, and when it's being collected into chromosomes, it kind of winds around like this, okay, and forms into that chromosomal shape, okay, and the chromosome is made up of different groups of genes. Okay. So a gene looks like this. If I break down the, um, the sequence or the strand of DNA, there's essentially uh, what's called an exon on both ends of the gene, okay? Exons and, uh, are essentially the thing that says the following sequence will tell you how to do this and then the end of it will be this sequence is now over right the next sequence tells us how to do this so there's these exons and then there's introns and the introns are the part that's actually the active part of the gene all right so there's if you've ever heard of the term junk dna that's kind of what the exons are is they don't really code for anything they just tell us that one thing is ending and the next thing is beginning okay. all right a is always paired with T, C is always paired with G. So when your cell needs to make something, it only needs to copy one side of the DNA strand because your body knows what the other side would be, all right? Because A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. So when you're going to uh, replicate DNA or when you're going to make RNA, okay, first you have this stuff called helicase, which comes along. You don't need to remember that, okay? It comes along and basically pulls the DNA apart, okay? And then you've got DNA polymerase. There's different types of polymerase, but essentially it's the part that builds the complementary strand, okay, to the other side. Everyone following me there? So that's the mechanism for replication, right? Um, so Watson and Crick said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a copying mechanism for genetic material. So they realized that since they said A and T must go together, C and G must go together, it would be really easy to copy this stuff because you just have to build a complementary strand, right? And so that's how your body does that. All right. Okay, so what Watson and Crick had discovered meant that only half a DNA molecule or a molecule of RNA was needed to decode or encode for information. It also meant that when mitosis, meiosis, or protein synthesis occurred, DNA could be unzipped and copied using only one side. And that's good because your cell may actually need a whole bunch of something and might actually be copying both sides of the DNA strand to make enough RNA for the ribosomes to make the stuff that you're in need of. All right, so it's kind of you know, valuable to have two strands in that way. Now, does this mechanism need to be pretty reliable? Yeah, okay? When you're pulling apart DNA and you're copying it, you want to make sure you get it back together the right way, all right? If you take it apart, you better be able to put it back together because if you don't, then you're going to have problems the next time you need that section of the DNA. 
fortunately for us, this is practically a foolproof okay, system. When it does fail, it's easy, however, to copy or to repair the damaged fragment. Okay, because you probably only damaged one side of it. Okay, so you always have the template strand on the other side that you could use to fix the strand that was damaged. Right, so again, there's another mechanism there for DNA repair that can be used. All right, so that's all we need to know about DNA. All right, last thing, we got to go into some detail here about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, okay? Most of the stuff we looked at in this unit, we talked about eukaryotes because they had compartmentalization, they had different organelles, and that allowed them to become specialized, whereas prokaryotic organisms didn't have any of the organelles, no specialization, so we didn't really look at them, okay? So what we want to talk about here is essentially a little bit more about prokaryotes, okay, and kind of the advantages and disadvantages of both. All right, key points. Be able to identify and describe the characteristics of a prokaryote or prokaryotic cell. Same thing, names reversed for eukaryotic cell. Okay, and thirdly, be able to distinguish between the two types of cells. That's easy. They don't look anything alike. A prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell are basically nothing alike. They're like apples and oranges. All right, they are very, very different. All right, so bacteria are prokaryotes. All of the bacteria that you might encounter are prokaryotic organisms. That means they are single-celled organisms that have no defined nucleus. I don't know if that's in your package, guys. I don't think it is, so just watch. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that before instead of stressing you all out, making you look for it. Okay, um, so they don't have a defined nucleus, and they don't have any membrane-enclosed organelles. So basically, guys, it's just because we talked about it already in Lesson 5 that I didn't put it in there. Okay, now... The other difference is, lots of these have cell walls, but they're not the same as the cell walls on a plant cell. They're made of something else. Okay? Typically, they're made of something called peptidoglycan. You'll never need to remember that. Okay? Um, this stuff makes them very difficult for your body to kill off, right? because the cell wall protects them from basically the way your body kills bacteria, which is you know your big killer T cells come in and try and eat them. All right, our leukocytes come in and try and eat them. Well, the cell wall that they have kind of prevents that. Antibiotics that we would take if we had a bad bacterial infection, okay, help to break down that cell wall and make it so that your immune system can, in fact, kill them off. All right, that was the big thing with penicillin. All right, it was discovered that when you had uh, fruit that was starting to rot, the mold that grows on it is called is penicillium mold. All right? And that's where penicillin comes from. Someone discovered, because they were studying rotten fruit or something, I don't know, that any fruit that had this mold growing on it had next to no bacterial growth ever. Okay? Bacteria simply didn't grow in these places where this mold was growing. Right? So they figured there must be something that this mold produces that stunts bacterial growth. So what they did is they started kind of collecting, uh, you know, and concentrating the stuff from this mold and then treating bacteria with it and they found that it killed bacteria all the time all right because what it does is it actually breaks down peptidoglycan the stuff their cell walls are made out of that's what penicillin does okay so penicillin breaks down the cell walls of these bacteria and makes it much easier to kill them when something becomes penicillin resistant then its cell walls are made of something else or its cell wall is cloaked okay in another membrane okay and then the penicillin can't get at it. So those would be penicillin-resistant bacteria. For those, you'd have to take stronger stuff like streptomycin okay, and things like that. All right, typically, prokaryotes will come in three shapes. Spheres, rods, and spirals. All right? The spheres are called cocci. C-O-C-C-I. Okay, anyone ever had strep throat? Okay, strep throat is caused by the streptococcus bacteria, okay, little spheres that get in the back of your throat and make it swollen, okay? Now, how do bacteria make you sick? What is it that they do? Because the way a virus makes you sick is it kills your cells and makes you kill your own cells, okay? But a bacteria makes you sick in a different way. Bacteria 
release toxins as they carry out their life cycles. And those toxins are what make you sick. So the toxins that streptococcus bacteria release make your cells irritated and they swell. And so your throat swells and it feels sore. Okay, that's why you get a sore throat when you have strep throat. Okay, the way they figure out if you have this and that they can treat it with penicillin is they take the big long Q-tip and they swab your throat and then they smear it on a petri dish, throw it in an incubator for a couple of days and then look at it under a microscope and go, oh yeah, little spheres, give him penicillin and he'll feel better. All right, if it comes back with a different kind, then they got to give you something else. Okay, um, the flesh-eating bacteria also a form of coccus bacteria, actually a mutated form, Streptococcus mutans mutans is what it's called, okay, and it uh, is basically a form of this that's highly mutated and obviously far more dangerous, okay. The rods, okay, these are called bacilli. Tetanus is a bacillus bacteria. You've probably all had a tetanus shot at some point in your life. If you hadn't, you should really get one. Okay, not because it's fun, because it isn't, but, okay, because tetanus, to get it, would really suck. What happens with this, with tetanus, is the toxin that is released by tetanus bacteria in, interferes with the way your muscles work. And eventually, your muscles cannot relax, because the toxin is interfering with the way that they uh, contract and relax, contract and relax, and so eventually they just contract and they get tighter and tighter and tighter, which is why tetanus was often known as lockjaw, because people would get to the point where they couldn't even unclench their jaw, okay, and yeah, they could actually even break their teeth, okay, um, because their jaw simply would not relax, and that's how they would die, okay, the muscles of their heart and their breathing muscles could not relax, and as a result, they couldn't ventilate their lungs, their heart couldn't pump, they would die. Okay? Yeah. That would be a really rotten way to go. Step on a nail and die because your muscles can't relax. Okay? Yeah. Get a tetanus shot. It's important. Yes. Okay? Another thing that's bacillus bacteria. Salmonella. So if you eat at Arby's, you get this. Okay? That's all right. I shouldn't bash Arby's, but I've only eaten there three times, and every time I've gotten food poisoning. So I just assume that they always have it. It's like on the menu. Okay. Here's our salmonella sandwich. Okay. Yeah. So yes, this stuff. If you get if you get the um, the uh, salmonella bacteria, it infects your upper intestine and stomach, and makes you violently ill. All right, because the toxins it produces irritates the stomach lining as well as the uh, lining of the intestine, and makes you nauseous and you throw up until you think you're going to die. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else had salmonella before? Yeah, it's awful. You don't want it. All right. Now, the spirals. Okay, they're quite a bit more rare. Okay, um, but they're typically the type that would cause bacterial forms of sexually transmitted diseases, like syphilis. Okay, for example, the syphilis disease is caused by a spiral bacteria. Syphilis is the one that makes you go crazy. Okay, people actually think Napoleon had it. Okay, um, before he died, and that's why he lost the Battle of Waterloo, because he was going nuts. So, okay, because it interferes with neuron function in the brain. The toxin it releases, uh, yeah, it interferes with your processing and makes you make bad decisions. All right, so those are the forms, okay, that you could encounter. All right, so like I said, there's different kinds. There's the spheres, the cocci, streptococcus mutants, okay, rod-shaped bacilli like tetanus, okay, and coil-shaped bacteria, okay, treponema pallidium, which causes syphilis, okay, so there you go. Now, bacteria are sensitive to the same things that we're sensitive to, extreme amounts of salt, okay, extreme temperatures, all right, stuff like that. Um, but some bacteria can live in those kinds of situations. Here's the good news, though. If you boil your water, you will kill any of the bacteria that could hurt you. If the bacteria that are in your water can survive being boiled, they're probably not going to hurt you because they won't thrive at your body temperature. Okay? Typically, you don't find bacteria that would survive boiling in water you would drink anyway. Right? Because I don't think you'd go like to Yellowstone Park and pull some water out of one of the geysers and go, I'm going to drink this. Okay? Because it's full of salts, and it's full of bacteria that can actually survive at that temperature. Um, there's also bacteria that can survive in incredibly saline environments. Again, those would not be bacteria that would survive in your body, because they can't survive in the more neutral conditions that are present in your body. Oh, Donna, can you let Philip in there? 
All right, so what we've done, what we've learned is that the bacteria that can typically make us sick don't like these conditions, so we use those conditions to clean things, treat food, okay, clean water, right, stuff like that. All right, so if we, uh, let's say, smoke meat, okay, or, or we salt it heavily, okay, if you've ever made beef jerky, you know, you put curing salt in it, okay, uh, that will essentially kill any bacteria that are in it and usually prevent bacterial growth for a long time. Also, it's dehydrated, okay, so it has less moisture in it, which is also a condition that bacteria would require, right, and so uh, preserved or jerky type meats will last a lot longer, okay. The picture on the left there is an electron micrograph of a cutting board, okay. What should you do with your cutting board on a regular basis? Oh, not with oil. You should bleach it. Yeah, okay? Like, especially if you cut meat. In fact, you should have a separate cutting board for meat and a separate cutting board for fruits and vegetables. All right? Why should you have separate cutting boards for those two things? Well, because typically your fruits and vegetables don't have as much bacteria in them. And secondly, you typically eat them raw. Whereas meat, not so much. So you cut the meat raw, and then you go on the same cutting board and cut your stuff you're not going to cook. That's how you can get salmonella, okay, is by transferring it over on the same utensil, okay, or on the same cutting surface. So typically, you should bleach your cutting board on a regular basis, okay, or run it through the sanitize cycle at the very least on your dishwasher. Okay. Everybody with me on that one? Yeah, okay, because that's not just bacteria, that's also fungus, all right? Now, I'm not saying that, like, this person never cleaned their cutting board. That's a cutting board that was washed. But every time you cut on your cutting board, you make a groove in it, right? You cut a slice into the cutting board. Well, stuff collects in there, right? As you cut, you force things down into that cut you made on the cutting board, and it's hard to clean in those really narrow cuts that you've made, right? Unless you soak it in bleach, okay? Then it can get in there and kill everything. So that's why you should probably do that, okay, as a health thing okay, for your cutting board. Because after swabbing this cutting board and going onto a Petri dish, this is what grew. Right? Every single one of these represents where a single bacterial cell was placed. That cell divided over and over again and makes what's called a colony of bacterial cells. Right? Everyone with me there? All right, so bacterial cell walls, like we said, they're analogous. They're not the same, okay? They're analogous, which means they're like an analogy, okay? They're similar, but not exactly the same. Okay, to the cell walls of a plant, okay, they serve a protective and supportive function, but they're made of different stuff, okay? They're made of that peptidoglycan I was telling you about earlier, okay, which is this kind of protein-like sugar, okay, that goes over top of the membrane. If you have a penicillin-resistant bacteria, they have a membrane, their cell wall, and another membrane. And that cloaks the cell wall and makes it difficult for penicillin to break it down. Okay, um, now, one of the main places where we see bacteria is in dirt. Right? And the bacteria in there are good. Right? They're doing lots of important things, like supplying nitrogen okay, and other nutrients to the soil by decomposing humus, not hummus. That's something else. Okay, that, I mean, they could be decomposing that too, okay, but this is humus, which is dead plant and animal material. All right, so uh, typically what we see, okay, in uh, soil microorganisms is, yeah, these aren't bacteria, these are sow bugs, okay, and they are in a compost heap. They break down the material by eating it, okay, and then the bacteria, some of the bacteria live actually in their intestines, okay, and the others would be living in the di semi digested. Uh, r remains of all of this stuff here, right? And they can um, convert that into ammonium, okay? That NH4 stuff we talked about, okay? Um, back in the chemistry unit, which is an important source of nitrogen for plants. Okay, uh, NH4 is good. Plants will use it, but they would much prefer to have NO3, which is Nitrate, okay? Nitrates are way, way better for plants because they're more easily turned into proteins and amino acids, right? And that's obviously what plants need nitrogen for, right? So um, they typically have nitrifying bacteria that will convert ammonium into nitrate. So there's all kinds of bacteria in dirt. That's why your parents probably told you not to eat dirt, okay? Because it is full of bacteria, right? They probably won't hurt you, okay? But they are in there. 
Okay, um, so in the nitrogen cycle, which is super important for plants, we've got all kinds of bacteria that are working. Okay, we've got nitrogen fixing bacteria that can take nitrogen right out of the atmosphere, which is good because over 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. All right, and so that stuff can get turned into ammonium, and then nitrifying bacteria will turn it into nitrates. Okay, we've got ammonifying bacteria that take the organic material, the humus, turn that into ammonium, and again, the nitrifying bacteria can turn that into nitrates, and the plants love that stuff. They can absorb it. There is, however, a set of bacteria that work against all that, denitrifying bacteria that turn nitrates back into atmospheric nitrogen. All right. What's that picture of? <coughs> it is. It's not the head. It's the point. Yeah, the pointy part of the pin. What's the yellow stuff? Nope. Yeah, it's a bacteria. Okay, so on the pointy end of the needle, okay, under an electron microscope, this is what the pointy end of a needle looks like. All right, it's it's blunt, okay, to an electron microscope. To our eye, it's very sharp. To our fingers, very sharp. Okay, but if you were like to take out a sliver with a pin, what should you do with it first? Burn it. Yes. Okay. I don't mean heat it up till it's glowing red. You don't need to do that. Okay. But you should probably take a match or a lighter and run it through the flame a few times, all right, just to kill off the bacteria that are living on the pin all the time, all right, because otherwise you could get an infection right, in that area. That's why you typically never see, you know, um, a doctor come around to give you stitches and just take a needle out of his pocket. Okay. And, oh, yeah, this will work. Uh, I, I use this on four other people. No. Okay, typically they won't do that because they could be passing on all kinds of stuff to you, viruses, bacteria, whatever, right? Um, but yeah, so they're always going to have clean, sterilized instruments, okay? So anytime you're going to, you know, let's say take a sliver out or something like that, you should make sure that you are using a sterile instrument. All right, now prokaryotes obviously are the most nu most numerous organisms on Earth. There's more pro prokaryotes in your mouth right now, okay, than all the humans who have ever lived. Yeah, think about it. That's a lot. Okay, and they're always in there. Okay, some of them don't hurt you at all. Others are the kind that can lead to tooth decay and bad breath and all those other nasty things. Okay, um, but they're always in there. And there are some bacteria that can thrive in habitats that are too hot, too cold, too salty, too acidic, too alkaline, whatever, for any eukaryote to survive. Okay, and part of that is because they lack the complexity that we have. Okay, and as a result, they can actually be more adapted to extreme conditions. So, uh, a prokaryotic cell has got the cell wall, it's got a nucleoid region, not a nucleus, okay? All the DNA just kind of collects in the middle, but there's no membrane around it to protect it. Since there's no membrane around to protect it, it can be easily damaged, which means this stuff can easily mutate, all right? There are ribosomes, okay, but ribosomes are not a membrane-enclosed organelle, all right? So they do have those for making protein. Right? And that's about it. Other than flagella, they don't have anything else inside. All of the stuff that goes on in all of our organelles all goes on in the cytoplasm there. Yes, they can. Okay? Viruses can infect bacteria. Okay? There's um, bacteriophages is what they're called, uh, viruses that infect bacteria. Um, and they're actually being used right now in genetic manipulation, genetic research. Um, what they're trying to do is have viruses change specific parts of a bacteria's DNA. If they can do that, then they can make, they can engineer viruses that can do the same thing for us. Okay, and then that could be used to engineer or correct genetic errors. Yeah. I don't know that they'd necessarily fight for each other, but fight with each other, but they might compete for resources. Yeah, they're not going to actively try and kill each other, no. Yes, but those are mutations that have happened in them. They haven't adapted, it's just a mutation that occurred. Remember I was telling you the other day, you can do that with a UV lamp. You can put E. coli bacteria under a UV lamp and make some that are... Yep. 
It happens. Yeah. That's why we're getting more and more and better and better antibiotics that can take care of them. Yeah. Alright. Okay, prokaryotic cells typically only have one chromosome, and it's in the form of a ring. So it's a circle, typically, when it's, uh, when it's being copied. All right? um, when they divide, those cells copy their DNA. They give one copy to each daughter cell. In times of stress, prokaryotes can go dormant, and they'll form what are called endospores, which is basically just, it looks like a dead bacterium. It just sits there and does essentially nothing. And then, when the conditions are right, it reanimates. Okay, and becomes alive again and starts dividing. Okay, it's believed that this was the cause of the curse of Tutankhamun, King Tut. Okay, the people that opened up King Tut's tomb died within a matter of weeks. Okay, and of course that got all the locals and and other people kind of, ooh, well he had a curse. We told you to leave him alone. Okay, you shouldn't have gone in there and taken him out of there. Okay, we told you he was cursed and now you're all dead. We told you so. Okay. Well, it actually ends up that later studies showed that they got sick. Okay, not that you know the curse killed them, but they got sick, and they believed that it was because of an endospore that they located on the inside of the sarcophagus. Okay. May have actually been the thing that killed King Tut, for that matter. All right, his corpse would have still had those bacteria in it, but they would have gone dormant after he died. All right, so it's possible. Right? These are the kind of the reasons why we also want to be careful if we are, um, you know, moving around a lot of stuff in very dusty areas. Right? You want to make sure you kind of wear a mask, okay? at least a paper mask, if not something even even tougher than that, to prevent the inhalation of any dormant bacteria. Okay? Or if you're cleaning out a barn, you don't want to inhale anything that might contain a hentavirus, like the, you know, dried um, uh, deer mice dander and stuff like that. You don't want to because that can contain uh, hentavirus and things like that. So, yeah. Okay, so most, most prokaryotes are chemoheterotrophs. There are some that are photoautotrophs. Blue-green algae would be the example of that. Okay, but most are chemoheterotrophs, which means they consume organic molecules, okay, like the stuff that's on a Petri dish for energy. Okay, eukaryotic cells, obviously, we've talked about those a lot. They have a true nucleus. They've got all the membrane-enclosed organelles, okay, and they do all of that kind of stuff. All right, um, they're specialized. Okay, prokaryotes don't have those, don't have any specialization. Okay, now the way that one evolved from the other, because eukaryotes they didn't just magically appear. Okay, they had to come from somewhere. The idea here, okay, is that what, if there's essentially one of two, or maybe a combination of both, that a bacterial cell um, started folding in. Its mem it had some sort of mutation that caused its membrane to fold in and create these vesicles essentially, and the vesicles inside later became specialized and, and came, started doing certain jobs and that's where organelles came from. There's not a lot of evidence to support that. There's more evidence to support the second idea which was called endosymbiosis, which basically means a large prokaryote absorbed other prokaryotes and they began to work together. Okay? Some of those prokaryotes were exceptionally good at carrying out the cellular respiration. Okay? Others were photosynthetic. Okay, and so they became chloroplasts and things like that. The evidence that supports that idea is that there is DNA inside of some of your organelles, separate from your own nuclear DNA. It's called mitochondrial DNA, okay, if it's in your mitochondria. And that kind of leads that they may have actually been their own separate organism at some point. Peter? Well, they would have just been inside, but not killed, not digested. They kind of resisted it, right? And so they began to work together after that. Well, actually, your organelles reproduce separately of your cell. Yeah, so when, mito when there's more mitochondria, mitochondria actually split in half to make more mitochondria. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of evidence to sort of support the second idea as opposed to the first one. All right, now, um, rather than answer these questions, let's think critically about a few things here. What kind of places would harbor the most prokaryotic organisms? Not always. Let's say, like, places we might encounter. What kind of places would harbor the most bacteria? Not necessarily harmful, just 
all kinds. Yeah, a phone. Phone's one of the worst ones. A public pay phone. You guys probably don't even know what those look like. Yeah, places where there would be lots of nutrients and stuff available for sure. Inside of the living organisms, yep. Money. Cool. Yeah. What's that? Doorknobs. Anything touched by lots of people. Public keyboards. Yeah. Okay. We actually, in uh, Science 24, okay, go around and do a lab where we swab things. Okay, and find out which things are dirtiest, right? And so people, you know, they they swab. They th everyone seems to think for some reason that the toilet will be the dirtiest place. The toilet is one of the cleanest places because it gets cleaned all the time, right? Nobody goes around and individually bleaches all the keyboards and all the doorknobs in the school. Okay, they clean the bathrooms, yes. Okay, because we have this idea that bathrooms are dirty. Well, you know what? Because they get treated differently, they're actually far cleaner than places we assume are clean. Right? So the places that are touched by more often than other places are typically going to harbor the most bacteria because what's on your fingers all the time? Bacteria. Okay, And they thrive in the oils and things like that that are naturally produced by your skin. And when you touch stuff, you deposit those oils. That's why you leave fingerprints and stuff on things. Okay? Your fingers are always leaving stuff behind. Right? So anything you touch is going to leave bacteria on it. Right? Um, during flu season, okay, um, typically what, what I recommend in my class is rather than shake hands to give a sign of peace, do this instead. Okay? Because typically you don't eat off of this part of your hand. Right? Anything on the palm or fingertips you want to try and keep clean. Okay? Um, so yeah, stuff like that. Think about it. Right? Um, this is the one thing like my grandmother always just tells when we get back from church, go wash your church hands. Go wash your church hands because what have you done? You just shook hands with everybody, then you went and got communion. Yeah, keep some hand sanitizer. <laughs> when you go to church, keep some hand sanitizer along, okay? Because you're gonna have the the host put on your hand, and then you're gonna pick it and put it in your mouth with your dirty hands. Okay, think about it. Right? There's all kinds of places. If you're a germaphobe, you're loving this right now, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just things to think about, right? All this, any time that you're going to take your hand and put it near your mouth or your nose, okay, or your eyes, you want to make sure it's clean, right? Because yeah. prokaryotes, they can survive in those kind of places, and they can survive for a long time. So think about it. All right, we got about 15 minutes left in class. Um, so you've got unit exam tomorrow. You got 15 more minutes to study.